So, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't be there. I'm isolating at home with my uh, no longer sick children, uh, but we're still home for a while. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, an application of my uh, mobility and migration model to, to coastal Bangladesh. I had thought I'd have a quiet four hour plane ride and a quiet hotel room to get these together, and I didn't. Um, so I'll do the best that I can. And I also will stress that I can in no way read the room. So um, in, in any case, if I'm going too long on any one topic or just need to keep going, feel free to, to shout out. So um, what I wanted to do for this talk in this group, um, given the sort of focus about extremes, was to tell a little bit about the modeling work we did in the paper and try and convey this, this one message on the people side, which is that for things that haven't happened yet, it's a real challenge to model what people might do because we don't have historical analogs. And we can address some of that problem by being good modelers and doing the best we can with data. And we can address other parts of it just by being careful and smart about how we apply the model and how we talk about the model. So that's the key message that I'm hoping some of what I show will get to. Now we just uh, had a wonderful presentation that involved a coupled agent-based model. Um, and so I, I'm gonna guess, again, not reading the room, that many of you are familiar with bits of agent-based modeling. And in particular, the thing that you probably know is that they are uh, models in which we have individual decision-making agents, whether they're people or firms or whichever, um, in which the properties that we're interested in at the system level uh, emerge out of interactions among those agents. and from those agents to their environments. And so they're, they're really great tools um, for problems where we believe that that heterogeneity really, really matters and is driving our system's results. So the things that if you haven't done a lot of agent-based modeling, you may not know, um, are that we're still kind of figuring things out a little bit. We haven't converged uh, in some of the ways that other modeling fields have on sort of universal ways of going about things, uh, universal theories, universal you know, uh, algorithms for representing particular decisions. And to my knowledge, although I've been a, a part of a few you know, attempts, there's no ABMIP uh, so far, no really good intercomparison that helps us understand what are the right ABMs for the right purposes. Another thing that, that's important to note is that because we're modeling individuals, making decisions, doing a lot of different things, it's really rare that we have all the data that we, we might want to calibrate and validate the things that are happening in our models. And we make it work. Um, we apply a range of techniques. We match patterns at different scales in order to try and reduce the, like, you know, the issue of uh, the equifinality problem where lots and lots of different models, different parameter sets can give us the same outcome that we're looking at. Uh, and one of the last things that can be a bit of a challenge is just that as much as there's some intuition to what agent-based models are, and we have individuals following rules that we can usually describe in a sentence, there's a lot of those assumptions to describe. The models get really big, and it can be challenging to communicate everything that's going on at the model. And that is part of what really limits their utility, because um, I think we all kind of know models aren't answers, they're outputs. And if you aren't able to think through what the set of assumptions underlying that model is, it's not easy to then make use of those uh, outputs responsibly. So that's the sort of other side. And now that I've set things up like this, let me tell you a little bit about my model that again, is too complicated to explain appropriately and doesn't have all the data that I'd like. So the model uh, Midas um, is, you know, a reasonably recent model in a long, long string of migration models that go all the way back to the 19th century and the laws of migration and the gravity models are appropriated from physical principles to look at big cities as centers of attraction. Now, the thing about those is that they are using the, the city or the place as the unit of analysis and not the person, but we have now, you know, about a half a century or so of demographics theories that help us think about migration as an individual decision. And in the last 20 or 30 years, we've got the computer power to really explore those. So um, among the, the big theories that we apply to think about mobility now, uh, particularly in the case of understanding migration decisions as a, as a livelihood outcome, are, are the sort of push, pull, and mooring theory. have been around for 20, 30 years. And so um, Midas is an implementation of that. What it looks like is this. Um, we have agents who are located in 
places. Um, they are embedded in social networks with uh, agents in the same place as they are in other places. They're deriving utility from some set of options that are in their place, and we can interpret those as jobs or access to family and nature and use value. Um, and yes, and they're sharing resources that they derive across their social networks. They're sharing information about the places that they are across their social networks. And periodically they're making decisions about, am I making use of the best portfolio of opportunities for me? And if it's the case that the best portfolio for them that they know of, maybe it's in another place, uh, if it's somewhere else, then they'll move. And so what makes this, or what sets Midas apart from other models, at least at the time that I wrote it, um, are that it's a simultaneous consideration of pushes, pulls, and moorings. And by moorings, I sort of mean these sort of kinetic barriers to doing things. I can't leave because I can't sell my house. I need to stay here because I'm taking care of family. You can't leave, these kinds of things. Um, and what I like about it as well is that migration is a, it's an emergent strategy among others. So it's not baked in that agents are deciding to migrate or not. They're making decisions about what's best for them where migration is an emergent outcome from that. So the question that we wanted to address in our Bangladesh case um, was looking at enhanced sea level rise due to climate change and wondering how is that gonna reshape migration flows towards the Bangladesh coastline? And here's what we had to work with. We had a few waves of the Bangladesh Household Income and Expenditure Survey, which is representative at the district level. There are 64 districts in Bangladesh. We had about 10 years partially overlapping of internal migration data in, uh, in Bangladesh among those 64 districts. And we had a model data set going out to 2100 uh, of decadal worst case, worst flooding predictions produced by Climate Central. Different pieces of a puzzle we wanted to tie together. And this is what we did. Um, we built a, a minus application based on that uh, household uh, income expenditure data as kind of like a, a jobs and income access model. And, and we calibrated it as best as we could to internal migration data that we had. We then took those flood depth projections to get an idea of how would the worst case flood be changing over the coming century. Um, and then, then this is the next piece we had to do. We had to translate those flood projections into some kind of a damage function. We had to try and find some idea of how is it that floods affect people, particularly in a space where floods are the norm. Floods happen every year. So we, we drew upon, um, there happened to be in 1998, where like the, the worst, um, the worst cyclone driven flood in like the modern record in Bangladesh happened to sit between two waves of a panel study where the researchers were able to estimate the sort of uh, wage damage effect of that shock. We're able to use that data as, you know, our best case estimate of what do we think future floods might do to, to wages both inside and outside of agriculture. And the other thing is we have no idea what amazing things are gonna happen in the economy over the next century and how uh, things are gonna change. And so we, I will go downstairs with you soon, but we're, we're talking right now, okay? Give us a few minutes. Um, we don't know what's going to happen, so we make the assumption that the economy doesn't change. And there's really no better way to get around that for now other than to embrace that assumption and be aware of it. So what do we do? We scale our sort of simulated economy by the expected flood damage functions. And then we look at what do we think might be happening to migration flows motivated by the decision model that I introduced earlier under different um, representative concentration pathways out to 2100. We look and see what the differences are. And the, the keys that we, the key findings that we have are this. So we, as you might expect, the uh, flood impacts on wages reduce migration towards the growth, the coast, but not enough to, that it doesn't persist. So we observe under all RCPs uh, that we have persistent migration towards the economic opportunities that even with the damages that we can account for would persist in the coast, of course. Thing, other things may change, but we don't have data uh, on that. So what I like about this result, it's a very agent-based model result, which says, look, we're not telling you that migration is gonna continue, but here's this plausible story where it could continue 
um, which kind of cuts against this narrative that where there's a new and unexpected flooding, people are going to leave. So let's be a little bit more careful as we think about things. Now, within this set of results, there are a couple of key things that matter. There are lots and lots of different sensitivity analyses. One thing that matters is how much credit we make available to uh, agents to make decisions. And one of the interesting things is that more credit doesn't always lead people to move more. In some cases, it leads them to invest in place, um, build themselves up and sort of become, if not trapped, certainly more moored than they might have been before. And then the other thing that really matters is uh, how much this thing that we experience now is a shock then becomes a norm. And this is a real challenge and it requires us to parse out, you know, um, what do people experience as uncertainty? What do they experience as expected variation? And how do those matter differently to the decision? And we don't have a lot of good data on that. We've all now just gone through over the last two years, like the biggest shock that we'll probably experience in our lifetimes. A lot of things have become normal, like your kids joining you in presentations. Um, and it, it's not obvious how universal uh, this experience is and generalizable across different uh, climate hazards, different different things that are going to matter in climate adaptation research. So this is sort of like a big unknown to try and address. Right, I got to this one already. So uh, access to credit doesn't necessarily move people more. So again, the things that are missing in all of this, we have no idea how we would expect coastal economies to change in the next century. Um, we also don't have any real idea, well, on the physical side, I think we, we might, we don't have good data on how um, the experience of enhanced sea level rise uh, and damages ensuing from that are gonna match the things that we have historical analogs for. So the sort of spatial and temporal correlation uh, across Bangladesh, for example, uh, of sea level rise is gonna lead people to you know, try and succeed through different strategies than you might see through a cyclone flood. People you know, you can, you can move or you can rely on, insur on insurance and other things to smooth uh, damages in one way when the threat's in one, in one place, but if it's everywhere, it's a very different experience. So this is a thing, again, we don't really have great analogs for. We don't know, as I said, how something that's a shock at first becomes really normal. And so, like, across this, as well as other sort of climate adaptation challenges, like, they're, they're sort of out-of-bag problems that are going to be expensive for us to try and reduce. Which isn't me saying, let's stop and not do anything. Um, we're going to get better at doing this. We're going to be better at converging upon you know, more universal modeling techniques. And we're already getting better at you know, not just generating data, but making better use of the data that we have. And I, I like this spectrum from like remote sensing on the one end through reliance on experts in the middle out to like the sort of like new exciting world of like high frequency mobile phone based data collection of like different ways to engage with, with people and learn things. Um, we can learn a lot uh, from being able to connect with hard to reach populations via mobile phone. It's expensive. It's not necessarily easy to scale yet, but it allows us to get to that point where we have like a true socioeconomic baseline that we don't have now. We can talk about things in terms of anomalies uh, in the same way that we can talk about sea surface temperature, uh, rainfall as anomalies. Um, at the other end, uh, we're getting so much better at picking up not just you know lights on lights off uh, in cities from space but learning about uh, whether not just that people have planted but maybe that people have switched crops or switched varieties we're starting to be able to pick up these things in smallholder plots from space which tells us a lot about behavior and thinking um, learning a lot about how to look at or pick out patterns of groundwater sharing and, and use from space um, and learning a bit about institutions. So finding ways to be smarter about getting the data in the background that can support your models is gonna be a thing that will, will lead us forward, but we're not gonna resolve everything. Uh, and the implication of that is that when we think about the kinds of predictions we ought to be making from coupled models stepping out you know, way into the future for things that haven't happened yet, um, we gotta do lots and lots of big sensitivity sweeps, uh, sweeps We've got to end up relying on really large ensembles of potentially different valid calibrations and thinking about you know, what's held in common, what you know, seems to be universally true across all of these big ensembles are universally untrue. And really, you know, I think this is always true for models of complex adaptive systems, but it's particularly true with the climate adaptation challenge of like looking for qualitative insights that we think are likely to hold up. And so this is a, a really important point, I think, to take forward when we 
make use of models in decision contexts for future projections. So trying to sum that up, um, the, the application that I share was the best foot forward that we had with secondary data and the group of experts that we were uh, able to work with. And my group moving forward now is we have a similar application um, looking at uh, climate mobility in Senegal. We have another application looking at um, forests, uh, sorry, at uh, fire as, a, as related to deforestation in Brazil. And uh, we're hoping to do other applications stepping forward. What I wanted to do in our time here was just characterize what is hard on the people side when it comes to climate adaptation problems uh, and may hopefully have a useful message about like what are the kinds of inferences that are appropriate when we use these kinds of models. So I'll stop there. I really appreciate you making time for us today. Uh, and in case you have any interest in talking further, um, you can reach me here. And uh, if I can hear them, I'll take any questions. Andrew, I hope you heard the loud applause there. Um, are there any questions for Andrew? Jonathan. Thanks, this very, very exciting work you're doing there. I'm curious, um, as you're doing your modeling of the decision making and the agents are kind of deciding what to do based on finding their best choice economically, are you looking just at the kind of um, cash economy side, or are you having something in there for like the hedonic utility that people like to stay in their village with the people they know? Yeah, these are really great questions. And I guess to some extent, you know, we can do anything we want if we're good coders, right? But the limitation is, is at the data side. And so to the extent that you have any kind of um, support for how one thing is valued against another, we can put it in there. And, and Midas is set up nicely to sort of plug and play, like, I want to consider this, you know, this form of utility and this form of utility and this form of utility, whether, you know, whether it's like use value, access to nature, uh, hedonic values, cash incomes. Uh, the trick is getting that data. And where we run into so many problems is like, um, like imagining you're really wanting to engage with trade-offs people make. Uh, and you want to say, well, I think I know people care a little bit about money, but they also care about time with their family and they care about not commuting and they care about their health. But labor people collect labor data, health people collect health data, environment people collect environment data and finding ways to get, you know, perspectives on all of those different things from one person is the sort of critical uh, task to better do the thing I think you're, you're describing here. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Andrew? If not, I want to thank Andrew for giving a presentation as well as juggling with uh, childcare there and COVID. So thank you. Thank you.